Um, good evening and welcome to the talk. Um, Black Buck, as you're aware, um, is the Vulcan operation into the Falklands. Um, it's the 40th anniversary and Martin seemed to think that I was a, a natural to give this talk. I'm not entirely certain why, but here we go. <laughs> I, shall, I shall use what little experience I've got of the situation. <laughs> Um, and I'll try to explain it to the best of my knowledge. I didn't, in fairness, know a great deal about it. I probably didn't any, know any more than any of you in the room um, until I read Operation Black Book, which is the book which has been produced. And I think I'll pop the copy out on the table there. Anybody wants to have a look at it. Um, filled with errors and inaccuracies, as all novels are, um, it's not entirely fiction, but it has missed some salient points and it has genuinely got one or two a little bit wrong. So I'll try to get around all of those. But let's begin in March 1982, 40 years ago. It was a typical March. It came in like a lion and went out like a lamb. And at Waddington in Lincolnshire, at Marham in Norfolk, it was the end of term. And the children were all just about to take their Easter holidays. And it was all nice and peaceful and quiet. And the crews were ready for an Easter stand down, looking for lovely sunny weather as we normally get at Easter, <laughs> sometimes anyway. In Waddington, it was very much an end of term mood because it wasn't just the children taking a holiday. The entire Vulcan force was due to stand down in July of 1982. So with that in mind, nobody was expecting to have anything more than a three month binge towards the end of their Vulcan time, and then they would go off and do something else. And in fact, the Nine Squadron were due to stand down on the 28th of April, and in fact did so. So they were in party mood all the way through Easter. And the general mood around was, well, there might be things going on in the South Atlantic, but A, they probably won't invade, and B, if they do, what's it got to do with us? We are never going to be involved. So with that mindset, let me take you into the story. That's if my machine will work. The Falklands, first of all, where are they? Uh, a long way away is the answer to that, in the South Atlantic. And if we're going to do anything, it's going to be a major problem. So the first question is, should we or shouldn't we? Do we or don't we? go and try and sort this problem out. <clears throat> well, first of all, let's have a look at just what the Falklands are. There are a group of islands in the South Atlantic, as far south as the UK is north, 51 south. Um, they were first arrived at by a Captain John Davis, and I think about 1690 or there or thereabouts. And uh, Captain John Davis was looking for promotion. So when he arrived and sailed in between the two islands, he decided to name it the Falkland Sound. And he did so because the fifth Viscount Falkland was actually the first Lord of the Admiralty. So he was <laughs> buttering up yeah. people above him to, I suspect, um, make a good story out of looking at this place and naming it as Falkland Sound. Thereafter, from the Royal Navy's point of view, the islands tended to become the Falklands. But they weren't inhabited by the Brits at that stage. And in fact, the first people to live here were the French, um, a group of French farmers, sailors, farmers, from Saint-Malo in France, um, settled and did some crofting with cattle, strangely enough, not, um, not sheep. So they settled here, and because they were from San Malo. They called these islands La Maloines. Do you see where I'm going with it? Okay. So the next expression of interest after the French had, had enough and gone home or died out or whatever they did was from the Republica de la Plata, Rio Plata, um, which is in modern Argentina, just right on the northern border. And some Spanish settlers came down, settled for a little while, didn't stay terribly long, by the early 1800s they'd gone, but they transferred the French name 
into Las Maldinas. So that's where we get the name from, uh, or the Argentinians get the name from. But as I say, by 1830, it had been resettled by British settlers, properly taking sheep with them. Um, and it has been a British crown property ever since then. So when the Argentinians invaded, we were a little upset. And so our wonderful prime minister at the time decided that she had to do something about this, call the defense chiefs together. And because it's a long way away by sea, she appointed Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse to be in charge of operations to retake the Falklands. We had to consider the distance to the theater. It's a very long way. We'll come back to that. We also had to look very seriously at the assets available. And as the Royal Navy yeah. people in the room will tell you, our fleet might have been bigger then than it is now, but it was a lot more of them than it had been. So could we do this? And the short answer was, the Royal Navy will find a way. And indeed they did. Allied support, absolutely crucial to have on side the United States of America. Remember Suez. Without America, we were not going to win a conflict. And it's equally true that we wouldn't have won this conflict if it hadn't been for the support of the United States. So fundamental to doing anything. And those three things were very taxing as far as John Knox, our Defence Secretary, was concerned at the time, and of course, Margaret Thatcher. The RAF's contribution to Operation Corporate was called into question, and Air Chief Marshal uh, Sir Mike Bean, Chief of the Air Staff, um, a gentleman that I have a very brief acquaintance with, was in fact an ex-Lancaster pilot from Second World War. So he was a bomber man. So he understood bombing, and he was extremely keen to use a bomber force. But before we get to that, he had three other groups to contend with. 18 group is our maritime group in the Royal Air Force. And of course, it's a long way by sea. You're going to use your maritime group. 38 group is a support group, which does tactical transport. And it also does tactical attack, ground attack missions. So we'll come back to that. And we have RAF1 group. Remember what I said about Waddington? We're all going to sleep. It's the end of term. We don't really want to get involved in this. The Air Force perhaps had other ideas. We need an offensive air mission to support the fleet operation that is going to retake these islands and the army operation that is going to go there on borrowed ships. And that was the only way we could get them there. But nevertheless, the offensive air mission became an absolute requirement. On the 4th of April, the CAS got together with Admiral Sir John Fieldhouse, who had proposed that the fleet uses its Harrier FRS aircraft, because these particular aircraft are in fact um, airborne fighters, if you wish. They are not ground attack airplanes, but they are designed fundamentally to control the sky and keep other people's airplanes away. So that was the contribution from the Navy. Contribution from the RAF. I've mentioned Mike Beaton. He's a bomber man. The next man down the list is David Craig, who had been my first station commander out at Akrotiri. Um, delightful guy. We also have to bear in mind that the Air Force has still got a Cold War to fight at the same time as running this Falkland operation. And what in fact happened was that David Craig was given day-to-day -day control of the Royal Air Force, the rest of the Royal Air Force, all the assets that were going down to be used for the Falklands were actually left with Mike Beetham, who then subpoenaed Ken Hare, who was another chap that um, I'd had contact with. He was the Inspector of Flight Safety when I did my course um, down at MOD. Um, delightful guy. Um, himself an ex-Harrier pilot. But we're from 18 Group, um, they also are co-located at the Northwood Naval Headquarters. So our air operation in maritime terms was already liaised into the naval operation. And the Nimrods, you'll see one there, without a probe, without a refueling probe, um, were already considered as dispatchable down to support the operation. 
but without a refueling probe, their range was extremely limited. They could only go halfway down to the Falklands and still get back to Ascension. So we have to talk about that too. 38. They have the ground attack Harriers under their control. And one of the first thoughts that Ken Hare had, who himself had been a Harrier pilot, was I can send these aircraft on the carriers and we can run a mixed fleet of Harriers to do both air support and to do ground support. And then, of course, 38 Group also has its VC-10s and its Hercules, and in fact, I've omitted from that, we also had the venerable Belfast still available to us at the time. And the reason that they were so valuable is to support all of this activity, we're going to need a huge amount of ground equipment on the ground at Ascension. Um, I'll come back to that again when we look at the photographs. From one group, Mike Deatham challenged Mike Knight, the AOC, with various thoughts. Please have a look at what we can do there. Should we be attacking the Argentine main, um, mainland? Should we be attacking the Falkland Islands? And if so, what are the targets going to be? Can we do mine laying to disrupt the naval presence of the Argentine Navy? Can we do leaflet dropping? Now, that's a typical might be the person because he'd actually been involved in leaflet dropping in Germany and in Holland at the end of the war. So it was a suggestion, but it was never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that one group, how we move forward another day, 5th of April, Mike Knight gets everybody together to talk about this aeroplane, <clears throat> the Vulcan. The Vulcan was designed and built as a nuclear delivery aircraft painted white, flying at high level, and dropping a single weapon. And if you dropped it anywhere within a couple of miles, it was going to take the target out. So the fact that it was using Second World War delivery equipment in its now bombing system, NBS, you'll see that come up again, and its radar system, H2S, straight out of the Lancaster Rift domain. And that's the equipment we were using. So delivery accuracy was not an absolute priority. In 1969, the backstory, the Navy takes the priority on running our nuclear deterrent. The RAF steps back and takes on a low level secondary delivery role of nuclear weapons. Dropping a bomb at low level, you have to get away from it. So cunningly, you put a little parachute on the back and as it drops out of the aeroplane, it goes boop, and disappears, and your aeroplane goes that way. And before it goes bang, with any luck, you're out of range. <laughs> if you do the physics, it's not going to happen. <laughs> okay? You are not going to escape. Have you ever seen the films of the atom bombs going off in Bikini? Yeah. Seen how quickly the blast went and moved? Okay, it's a one way mission for Vulcan pilots. This one. And for the rest of the crew. But most critically, to go that far, the little sticky bit at the front is called a refueling probe. The refueling probes in these aeroplanes have not been used since 1962. We're now talking 20 years later. One of the problems they found in the very early days was if you don't use something, it tends to leak a bit. So the front end, the last thing you want is fuel going forward through the probe, dropping out, coming back at you, into the intake, potentially. Not a good thing. So what they decided to do was to use a plastic cement inside the tip of the probe to seal them off. So now, no fuel can go that way. But it does mean if you want to use them, no fuel can go the other way either. So it's an issue. Can these probes be made to work? This is a series of problems that Mike Knight faced and asked questions about when he first thought about what can we do. First of all, there are two different series of engines, and he would only accept the aircraft with the higher rated engines, the more powerful ones, the 301s. Then he demanded that we have reliable now bombing system platforms. Acceptable bomb racks. What a devil on earth. Right. If you're going to drop conventional bombs, you rack them up seven at a time, four at the top, three at the bottom. 
and you need the bomb rack to take them. The problem is that because the UK Vulcans had not dropped conventional weapons for some time, we kind of lost control of where the acceptable bomb carriers were. A number of them were later found on scrap heaps, refurbished and then used, but I didn't tell you that. The 90-way selectors are the coming way of telling the bomb what it has to do when it leaves the aeroplane. So it sets the timings for the release of each bomb in sequence. It tells the fuses how to operate, whether it's going to be an air burst, ground burst, a subsurface burst, and also the order in which the bombs drop off and the gap between the bombs. So it's a really important piece of kit. So they have to make sure that they had some of those serviceable. And then the most amazing thing of all is, if you're going to go bombing, you have to have bombs. Has anybody seen the bombs? Now I'm being slightly facetious, but when the count was done between the Middle East, where we still have a few, and UK, deep storage, and on the airfields, there were 167 bombs available. 21 at a time, sorry. 21 were going to be dropped at a time. Do the maths, we don't have many options to drop lots of bombs. We need to practice with them first. Got to have some practice drops. And then we've actually got to go and do it for real. So an enormous shortage of bombs. Two different kinds of bombs. There's cast casings and uh, forged casings. And they behave differently. And as a, an armament expert, you want to know which one you're going to use for which kind of explosion. So there's all kinds of things going on about these bombs, which Mike Knight is not terribly happy about, but there we are. It's what he has to live with. I've mentioned the refueling probes. I'll come back to some other difficulties that we have with those, but they are key to this entire exercise. ECM protection, electronic countermeasures won't mean very much to you, but when you're flying at a target and somebody's radar goes beep, 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 I'm looking for you, you begin to worry. And when it goes, <laughs> you need your brown trousers on because it's serious. But the equipment that you have in the aeroplane is designed to stop the radars being effective. But our Vulcans are equipped to counter Soviet radars. They are not equipped to counter modern French radars, which is what the Argentines have got. So immediately we have to consider some kind of change to our ECM equipment before we can actually go and effectively say we will be safe going on to that target. Omega navigation system. Um, the Vulcan's navigation system is the same generation as bombing systems. It's Second World War equipment. It's not terribly accurate. It tends to drift over a period of time. <coughs> And if it drifts even at an average rate that you would be used to going from Ascension down to the Balkans over 3,600 miles, you could very easily be between 20 and 40 miles off track when you get there. It's serious if you're trying to actually hit a target <coughs> accurately. So they have to do something about the mass systems. The second half of the equation on refueling is you have to have aeroplanes that can give fuel to the Vulcan. I should have mentioned on the Vulcan, sorry, that there were only 32 left in the Air Force and only half of those were 301s. Well, on the Victors, there were 23 Victors in the Royal Air Force at the time. It's not very many. Many of those would have been on servicing and therefore Mike Knight, in his requests, said, I must have fatigue unlimited aeroplanes, aeroplanes that have plenty of life left in them. Now, what do I mean by that? Two things. One, servicing is required on aeroplanes on a schedule basis. Um, <coughs> level one, level two, level three, level four. And as they increase in hours, then the depth of the servicing required increases. So they have to be out of service for longer. And engineers on stations will schedule the aircraft through engineering support over a period of time, which means 
you've probably got 40% of your fleet out all the time. So you're left with not very many aeroplanes to choose from. The second element of fatigue is that aeroplanes shake themselves to death over a period of time. One of the reasons the Victor did not convert from being a high level nuclear bomber into a low level bomber is because it literally could not put up with the wings doing that all the time at low level. Desperately uncomfortable for the crews, but even worse for the air. So fatigue fractures within the main spars became something that they literally couldn't put up with. But they did become a heck of a good tanker. So, you know, out of something that is not so clever came something that was quite good later on. Because without these tankers in the Falklands War, this would never have worked. Very, very good tankers. We also required those tankers to be able to do photographic reconnaissance because they were the ones that were going to make it down to the Falklands. So we had to put PR cameras into the ones that were going. We'd had a squadron called 543 who were PR years before. We'd stopped them doing that when the cameras took over photographic reconnaissance again. And those cameras need to be found again for the victors. Refueling give and take. Although they have to be able to give fuel to the Vulcan for a plan like this to work, they also have to be able to accept fuel from another victor so that you get double extended range. And then the Omega nav system is exactly the same as the others. And at the end of the day, this is what we are looking for, successfully matching a Vulcan with a Victor. We move forward now to the 9th of April. The 9th is a Friday. And after a week of considering all the options with this engineering stuff at group and talking to the stations, we can now declare that RAF Waddington from each of the four squadrons will provide a crew and the station will provide 10 aircraft that fit the bill of what Mike Knight was looking for. Marum 55 and 57 squadrons are required to provide from their 23 total aircraft, 18 that could actually go to war. That was a massive ask. So the fact that they achieved that, I think, is more extraordinary than the Vulcan story. For me, this is about what the victors did. Yes, the Vulcan boys got the medal, but it's actually about how good these victors were. So on the 9th of April, the op order goes down to the stations to actually tell them. And this is the first time they've formally been told, your stations are going to war. You now need to ready your crew. So from the 2nd of April to the 9th is a full week before the stations were advised, you are now involved in combat operations. Leave cancelled, of course. It was a bit of a rotten Easter mm -hmm. um, because the 9th was actually Good Friday. Mm -hmm. The 13th is the day after Easter Monday when people went back to work. So <coughs> a lot of the staff on the station were working. The squadrons worked and the pilots were not there to be told. So it was the 13th before we established the full command and control required for the Vulcan to operate. Simon Baldwin had been my boss on Giant Voice, which is what the chief he said is. Wear the batch. Um, he re-establishes the Giant Voice cell, which had existed to improve professional operating standards to the best that they could be so that we could actually join the Americans in our bombing competitions. Um, and we usually did quite well um, against them, but he was an exceptionally professional man, quiet, unassuming, pipe smoking. You never see pipes these days, but Simon was a, an inveterate pipe smoker. Gave him time to think between talk, have a profit pipe. But he was a lovely man to work for. Couldn't have been a better qualified um, navigator to actually lead this operation. And then one of each crew had to be selected from the squadrons. There was a little bit of tussle about who it should be. Um, Alistair Montgomery had been my co-pilot leader on Nine Squadron when I joined it. Lovely Scotsman, bit of a terrier, but he would always get the job done. And he was a very, very good pilot. Um, Jim Gardner, I was on 50 Squadron with Jim. 
He was given the vote by OC 50 squadron. John Reeve, where the slash is, had been my captain out in Cyprus. I'm my co pilot. Um, an interesting man um, from, from the right side of the River Mersey, from, from the left bank, is that right? Um, but he was, could be, a little bit of a bull in a china shop. Thoroughly professional, thoroughly knowledgeable. Um, in the Air Force, I was always somewhere around about the bottom of the class in ground school. John would always be at the top of the class. I hated him for it. <laughs> Clever guy, average pilot. Would he have made the cut if I'd been there? Possibly not. <laughs> anyway, um, I should say, he was known as Vic when I was on his crew. Um, he was called Vic because he was a nose with a drip at each end. <laughs> was, there we are. Um, Martin Withers, I was on 50 with Martin, um, lovely, unassuming guy, you may have seen him on television because of course he eventually was the main man, um, couldn't have been a more professional guy to actually do the job, delighted to see him. Neil McDougall, the oldest of the group, had been on the Air Force, since, on the um, V Force since 1962, I didn't know him personally, but he was an elder citizen. Um, and certainly knew the Vulcan inside out. He was the only one of this team who had ever done any air to air refueling. On the last occasion he'd been involved, the squadron commander was up doing air to air refueling with him and he broke the probe off his Vulcan. And that was the last time the Air Force refueled until 82 from a Vulcan, or two Vulcan, sorry. Now, um, where did I go? Sorry, no, I'm not pointing up the right one. At this point, the station commander intervened and Jim Gardner's name was off the list. Um, and John Reeve was given the, the push. Now, um, I joke about John, but in all fairness, all of these guys have got three tours minimum on the Vulcan. In Neil McDonald's case, he had six. So these were people who knew the inside and out of it. They'd all been involved with giant voice training in the past, so Simon knew them, um, and they were all eminently qualified to actually do this. However, the conventional bombing world had disappeared from the Air Force some time ago. None of them had air to air refueling training, and they were all boat happy when they first got together on the 13th of April. To be told, you've been picked, get changed. So, on the 14th of April, the operational workup begins. This is what we're trying to get people to do. And to do that, first of all, you have to get air-to-air -air refueling instructors, AARIs, from the Victor to come to Waddington to fly in the right-hand seat, the co-pilot seat, with the captains to actually train them how to do air-to-air -air refueling. No ground school. They sat in the seat with 10 minutes time in the simulator, that's all we were given. 10 minutes in the simulator, come on, we're going flying. They, they went off flying and astonishingly, even on the first attempts, people were actually managing to succeed in refueling. So the skill level increased was very rapid, very quick, but it wasn't always a straightforward <coughs> and easy story. So the captains were qualified in air to air refueling within a couple of days. They then had to get the Vulcan co pilots qualified. So the AARIs would stand on the ladder at the back between the two pilots. The two Vulcan pilots would sit at the front, as they normally do, um, and basically taught them how to do it that way. So it worked. Gosh, even the co pilots can do this. Maybe it's not that difficult. <laughs> yeah. The rub of it is that this is absolutely lovely on a day like that. But these guys have to do it in the dark. So conversions from day flying into night flying, and they happen on the same day. So you day fly in the middle of the day, you go and have six hours off, you come back, and then you go night flying, do it all again. Uh, these guys were working hours that you just simply can't believe. Um, it was damned hard work. Picking up on the conventional bomb drop, it's actually, the book is wrong. This is one of the reasons in the book. It tells you 
that nobody in the Air Force was current on conventional bomb dropping. I hate to say it, but I was. Um, this is one of the bizarre things. Out in Cyprus, when I was flying with John, we had Near East Air Force commitment still to do conventional bombing in support of center. And we used to drop bombs from time to time out in Mazira, um, in just beyond the Gulf. Um, but also on Episcopi range, you got the odd bombs to drop. And so, in fact, nine squadron crews that had been in Cyprus up until 1975, when the defence regime brought everybody back to UK, were in fact conventionally bombing qualified, as was John Reef. Um, so the book is incorrect to say that nobody was. And in fact, I and my crew were the last Vulcan to drop conventional bombs in 1977. Um, on the Derby range, just off the Iron Man, um, I had a stick of 21 to go and drop. And the requirement there was that every five years the Air Force decided to drop a stick of 21 to make sure they worked. And if there were misfires, how many? What is the percentage of bombs that is not working in our armory? So I literally had that mission. Um, but I was the last Vulcan to actually go and do that. But I wasn't on the force when this happened, so it's too late for me to actually get involved. Um, but there was some expertise. It wasn't entirely dry. And then target planning in the background all the time, there is an element of what is the target going to be? And at that stage, it had not been decided and it hadn't been decided how many bombs to drop, where to drop them. The assumption was that the Vulcans would go in low level. What is low level? 300 feet, 250 feet, 100 feet, you tell me. At war, you go as low as you can, but you need to be at a minimum height of about 300, even to drop retard bombs. And that's exactly what these crews trained for. They trained themselves up by going up to um, the range on the north of Scotland. And each of them were given a stick of 21 because they needed to know what it felt like. It's a bizarre feeling when 21,000 pounds drops out of your aeroplane in the space of, I'm trying to think what it would be, in the space of less than 10 seconds. Um, each one that goes, it's another thousand pounds gone and the aeroplane literally bounces ever so slightly. To keep it flying straight and level because the weight of the aircraft is reduced, you have to lower the nose because otherwise it's hard to climb. So with 21 going off, it's one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six. Um, and if you do drop them on retard, you then, begin to feel the explosions behind you, and that itself pushes the tail of the aeroplane up. So from doing that to correct the bombs going on, you know, doing that to stop the tail. It's uh, interesting. The target planning is going on, but nobody's talking about it. There is an assumption that it's 21,000 pounds on the runway at low level, fast as you can. And then an intelligence digest. This is where the electronic countermeasures come coming in. You need to know what you're up against. What are you fighting? What are the radar systems? What do you have to do to stop them? Are there guns? The big fear that we always have on the Vulcan isn't missing guns. Uh, if there are all lead coming in your direction, you know what you can do about it. So you don't want it there unless you can avoid it, uh, um, unless you have to. So you need to find out what it is that the Argentinians have actually moved from the mainland onto the island itself. And the big fear was the Erlikon cannon, um, which had a maximum height of about 7,000 feet, although the, the rounds would go higher, but they were literally coasting after that. They were, you know, they were really moving below that, but above that, you kind of just took your chance of it and <coughs> banging the aeroplane, but not doing too much damage. So, these were the things that people in the background were actually having a good look at. And that is what they succeeded in doing on 14th of April, first day. So, why do Wake Airfield? This is the airfield we're gonna use in the middle of the Atlantic as the halfway point. It's a long way. We've got to do all this planning to get them there at 4,200 miles. A Vulcan can't make it in one hop. Um, it needs to refuel at least twice. 
part of the problem with the Vulcan at this stage was that it was exceedingly heavy. They were designed to fly to maximum weight at 204,000 pounds, having taken off, got up to high level and then cruised. In the cruise, normally with a nuclear weapon, you're simply going to lose weight all the time. So you're getting lighter the further you go, therefore the further you can fly. But if you keep topping it up, the weight doesn't go down. And so the engines are constantly using more fuel than the graphs tell you you're going to use. And that was to become a massive, massive issue, an underestimation on the amount of fuel used. Because of the extra weight, they couldn't fly as high as they wanted to. And the strange thing about jet engines is the higher you fly, the more efficient they are, the less fuel they use. The lower you fly, the less efficient, the more fuel they use. So you've got two things running against you. The weight is a really bad issue. So we have to work out how to do that. Heavy equipment delivery, I've mentioned, we have to get all that down to the Falklands and the transport fleet literally has started already taking stuff down from the 14th of April onwards. We'll look at the runway. I'll show you a picture of that, but a long, narrow runway in terms of perspective is really quite difficult for a pilot. It's not impossible, it just makes it a bit more difficult. But worse than that, there is no taxiway running beside this runway. If you land one runway, it has to go to the end, stop, turn around, come back, and then clear at the landing end of the runway. It does mean that it might be anything between eight and 10 minutes from one aircraft landing to another one being able to land. That's a problem when you fly informations. They're all going to come back short of fuel, they're all going to run at once. So we have a real issue there. Water and food. Normally, 20 people maximum operating on this airfield at Wide Awake. We are now talking about having two to 3,000 people there. It's a very dry island. It doesn't rain much. So collecting water is a massive issue. But even worse, if you're going to fly all these aeroplanes off, where are you getting the fuel from? And this is where international relations comes in, because the Americans, God bless them, who actually run wide awake airfield, the runway having been extended because of the space shuttle, it was a relief landing ground for the space shuttle. And that's the only thing that made it usable for these very large airplanes, very heavy airplanes. So fuel supplies, thankfully, the Americans, when asked, provided one massive tanker of aviation fuel every week from the middle of April onwards. So uh, thankfully, the Americans at a certain level were certainly coming on side. From Ascension, the Falklands return journey is 7,600 miles. It's a long way with a very heavy bomber, with fuel requirement that you don't really need. Um, the reason we don't need it is when it was designed for its original purpose, the top line of the graph was at 204,000 pounds maximum all up weight. These aeroplanes were operating 10,000 pounds above that. And it's not a straight line graph, it's exponential. So you can see the difficulty of trying to work out how much fuel are we actually going to need. And it was a bit of a stab in the dark that nearly didn't work. This is the airfield. Now, this photograph was actually taken long after the war. Um, and if I just point out to you, the end of the old apron was there. That bit didn't exist. And there was more parking down here. So possibly about the same amount of parking, but it gets rather crowded. The other thing to notice is there are cliffs here. <laughs> From a pilot's perspective, that's a massive cause of turbulence if there's a strong wind. It's also a perspective issue because as you're flying into it, um, this falling ground in front of you, it gives you an illusion of being higher than you actually are. If you think that, you have a tendency to want to take the aeroplane lower. You can understand that that's getting you into dangerous territory. So that's an issue. Um, secondly, if you look there, the runway is sloping up from the landing point to there. And then from there to the end, it's sloping down. Now, to experienced pilots, it's not a particular issue, but it does mean in an ideal world, you want to land before the hump. If you don't, you're not getting any of the benefit of slowing down, going uphill before you're suddenly going downhill and braking gets a lot harder. So as, a, as an airfield, as the runway, it's not the easiest. This picture also shows a loop here, which allows people to 
stop, taxi off and wait. That wasn't there, as I've described earlier. So the runway had its complications. 16th of April was the date on that, and I should point out that that was the date at which um, the AOC had decided that Jerry Price, who was the station commander at um, Marum, was going to become the commander down at Aria for Century. Um, so he was given notice on the 16th, and he actually went down on the 18th and activated Aria for Century. This photograph is actually taken nearer the end of the month than the 18th of April, because in fact, all the victors have arrived. By the 18th, there were only four on the ground at that stage. But of interest um, are these Nimrods in the foreground, and they all have refueling probes. Every Nimrod that was sent down had been retrofitted with a refueling probe, and the crews had been trained, just like the Vulcan crews had been trained, so that they could actually double their time on task down in the Falklands. So not part of my story at all, but it's an astonishing part of the story of how the RAF stood up to the task of getting all these very large aeroplanes down there and operational. There are, I think, 11 victors in the photograph, which was the total number that we're going to be need for the Black Book Raid. Just in the foreground of the photograph, oops, sorry, I didn't need to do that. Is it going back? Just in the foreground um, are some Harriers. And these are in transit with the fleet, but for whatever reason of commercial, don't really understand. Not part of the story, so let's move on. 18th to the 24th of April, this is where it all gets serious. We've proven that we can do air to air refuel with the Falcons. We've had problems. Um, those problems have been essentially when the probe disengages. There's been a flush of fuel going forward through the probe and then splattering back over the top of the windscreen, blinding the pilots for a short period of time. Um, which, when you're very, very close to another very large aeroplane in front of you, can be a bit of a frightener. Um, and by this work of period, even by the 24th, they hadn't sorted the problem out. So we're still having those. Two other incidents had occurred. Um, John Reeve had broken the tip of his probe on his second attempt to do air to the reef um, I might say that's typical of what John might do, but uh, couldn't possibly comment. Um, the other problem that had happened is, is Monty, who I'd said was a bit of a terrier, had actually charged a basket on one occasion um, and actually broken the basket off, which had gone down one of his engines. Um, both of those incidents, John lost two engines as a result of his incident because the probe went straight down number three. Um, there tends to be a habit in the Vulcan because the two engines are very close together. If one's going to go out, the other's going to go out as well. Um, they recovered, they landed the aeroplanes and they you know, didn't have time to go to the bar because they were going flying again, but no one. Um, Monty's situation was very similar. Two engines went out, he got them back again because it had just been a flame out. Um, but it was a bit of a frightener for the crews. So here we are heading towards the 24th of April when things should have been done and dusted and there's still this massive concern. Mike Knight at one group called a conference at Waddington, brought in engineering specialists from Marham, told them to bring a probe from Marham. There's something different about the Victor probes and the Vulcan probes, and I want to know what it is. This conference went on all day. They dissected the probes, and there was indeed a difference. When they'd taken the concrete out of the front of the probes on the Vulcan, they'd missed the fact that shim was required to refit the valve inside. And so that shim being missing, which a shim is just a big washer, effectively, seals the thing off once the fuel flow has stopped. Those shims had not been put into the Vulcan probes. So on the 24th, they knew how to fix the problem. Suddenly, we can get past this. However, in this same conference, Monty, our lovely Scottish lad, stood up, opened his mouth, and said completely the wrong thing. We're never going to solve this problem. You know, it's going to be an issue forever. How can we go to war like this? But he spoke out of touch. In fact, the engineers had, in the background, solved the problem. It was to have an impact. So, um, 
we've resolved our air to air and our conventional delivery, we think. The inertial navigation system, I haven't mentioned this, the Omega proved not to be accurate enough and couldn't be tweaked enough. But the RAF had bought um, British Airways fleet of VC 10s and sat them on the ground at Prize Norton, just waiting to be used, if ever. Um, in some the VC 10s, they had much, much better navigation equipment called inertial navigation platforms, twin INAS, in fact. Um, the VC 10s sat on the ground doing nothing, had their systems robbed, and they were fitted into both the Victors and the Vulcans. So the aeroplanes flying had this INAS navigation system, which made it much, much more accurate. So that problem became solved as well. Westinghouse ECM pod, the electronic countermeasures on the Buccaneer fleet at the time, Westinghouse had designed a pod which was much cleverer than anything that we had on our old Vulcans. It had to be fitted externally under the wing. Um, but it meant that you could actually counter virtually any radar because you could tweak much more onto the frequencies of any radar that you sensed. So these Westinghouse pods were very, very much better. And in fact, in the space of about three days, designed and fitted under the wings of Vulcans um, and in fact, Nimrods. <clears throat> the problem is, well, we know what the problem is. We think we've solved it. <coughs> Now we come to very, very critical dates on the 26th of April. Monty had um, was hauled into the station commander's office, thinking as he went in, I've been picked. <laughs> I'm going to drop bombs. <laughs> um, to be told, Monty, you bag, you're going to Ascension on a VC-10. What he had, in fact, done, his dropping it, that kind of led to him being nominated as the detachment commander. So in a sense, his organizational concerns and skills have been recognized above his piloting skills, perhaps I'll put it politely like that. Um, but, but Monty took it in good part and, and did a really first class job looking after the crews down in the section. And he literally traveled down on the 26th. It's pack your bag, say goodbye to Ingrid. And there's a car taking it to Bryce Norton. Um, 28th of April, well, the CAS approves an attack profile change, and this comes as an enormous shock to the crews. Simon Baldwin had been sat at Waddington concerned about the gunnery that the intelligence told him was arriving on the Falkland Islands. And the last thing he wanted to do was be sending his crews down there to be shot down. And he determined that perhaps the best way to deliver the weapons wasn't at low level, but medium level, and had picked 8,000 feet as the optimum height. Um, when the crews were told this, they were absolutely devastated because they just spent all that time learning how to drop lots of bombs in the dark at night using terrain following radar, which is not an easy skill. Um, and to a degree, that was wasted. Simon's thinking was supported by the Chief of the Air Staff. Now, we are talking about a Second World War bomber pilot who understood medium level bombing. And he approved the idea that that perhaps would be the best way to deal with the issue. On target selection, they also decided on runway at Falklands to deny that to the Falklands, to, to the Argentinians. In my view, incorrectly, because Mike Beatham's experience was Second World War, inaccurate, generally speaking, bombing from Lancaster. He had suggested we use the same runway attack technique that they used in the Second World War, which is 35 degrees offset from the runway, which guaranteed you'd get one bomb on, possibly two bombs out of the four. It's my view that the Vulcan was better than that, and that these crews were better than that and that they should have taken an attack angle that was considerably less. And I'll try to prove that to you in a little while. And then the transit plan. Monty's gone to Ascension, um, but we have to get the Vulcans down there. So they think about that. And they think it's two and a half victors per Vulcan. So if you're going to send one, you need three. If you're going to send two down, you need five. 
etc. So it's decided that two will go. The first thing that happens, one group do the fuel planning and work on an extraordinarily false figure. The crew come in to plan in Waddington operations for an 11 o'clock takeoff on the night of the 28th. And Don Dibbins, who's the, the co-pilot, um, Martin Reeves, co-pilot, uh, sorry, um, John Reeves, co-pilot, went through the fuel calculations, wasn't happy, went to the op staff and said, I don't think there's enough fuel. I think we have to do something about this. Uh, well, you can't because the number of victims you've got is the number you've got. You can't be right, was the answer. Well, of course, Don actually was an exceptional pilot. And he said, no, I want somebody else to do the fuel figures. So John Reeve came back into WAPS, went through the fuel figures and confirmed that Don was right. They could not get to Ascension with the fuel loads that were being planned for them, with the Victor support that would be given. And so this is by now 9.30 in the evening on the 28th. They had no option but to ring Mike Knight at one group and say, we can't go. Now, for an AOC, uh, does not want to hear that his crews can't perform the operation they've been given, but it actually wasn't their fault. The flight is cancelled on the night of the 28th. So between the 28th and the 29th, these crews are in full flying kit, airplanes loaded, bombs are all on, their personal kits on board the airplane. They're told, go home. Come back in tomorrow. They've said the farewells to their wives. They've written their letters in case they don't come back. Um, kiss their children goodbye, you name it. And now they're going home. Um, they didn't all go home. They went to the mess. I think had a few beers. <laughs> but um, only one of them actually went home, which I was, I think, quite brave. I'm not quite sure. I've got two minds about it. I, I, I probably would have gone home and fucked myself. But there we are. Um, so now we come to the 28th, 29th. And having sorted out the fuel figures, three victors per Vulcan now, two of them went down on the 29th overnight, 1100, arriving at seven o'clock in the morning. And there they are, parked on the apron, um, ready to do what they're expected to do. This is arriving seven o'clock on the 29th, on the 30th, sorry, 29th on the left. 30th. Uh, I've talked about all that. Oh, sorry, yes. On the ground, on the 29th, at the same time, knowing that the operation was working, Monty, with the tanker crews, worked out that this is the refuel plan to use. Three waves of aircraft. Now, just to describe, you won't all be aware, but the majority of the aeroplanes are victors. So the shape with the swept wing, they're the victors, okay? Four in the white wave, four in the red wave, and in the blue wave, you've got two Vulcans, nice big triangles, and three victors. That was the plan on the 29th. How are we going to do it? And I'll go through with you exactly how we did it. The first problem was that Blue 5 didn't exist. The aeroplane wasn't serviceable on the ground, and so in fact, they were one short before they ever got airborne. That's just a view inside the reason all this was happening. And I said, we'd talk about the bomb carriers and the bombs. That is the load inside. I think it's John Reeves aeroplane actually, because he was the primary on the night. So John Reeves is going as Blue 2, who is the primary. Blue 4 had parted with his crew in it. And we'll talk about the Victor crews as we need to, as we get to them. So this is the night. That's the planning stage, sorry. And on the night of the 30th of April, again, an 11 o'clock takeoff, this is the order of battle. So, sorry, go back slightly. As planned, with the exception that Blue 5 is not there, it doesn't go according to plan. John Reeves' aeroplane is Blue 2, and that shows an arrow turning back to the airfield. And in fact, what happened is John got airborne having failed to close the side window on his cockpit. Now, it's a moot point about whether John was at fault or whether it was a genuine technical problem that he couldn't close it fully. I 
have my own view, but we'll just let it rest there. John got virtually up to 20,000 feet before he finally admitted he could not take his airplane any further. It simply wasn't pressurizing properly, and the temperature inside was getting colder and colder and colder. Totally unsustainable. So he turned back from about 20,000 feet. His problem now is he's got the heaviest Vulcan he's ever flown. Mm -hmm. Totally overweight for landing. He's carrying all his bloody fuel. And you can't dump fuel from a Vulcan, unlike modern aeroplanes. So you have to burn it off. Um, in the process of burning it off, the dam nearly is. Right? No comment. Um, but John, anyway, is out of the running. So he was the primary, but he is no longer. So Martin Withers now becomes the primary Vulcan. Blue four. So the Withers crew are in the role, um, and they accepted it very graciously. I think, you know, I think Martin's words were something to the effect of, well, boys, we've got a job to do. The victors. Well, we'd lost one before takeoff because of servitability issues. And at the top of climb, one of the things the victors have to do is to prove that they can actually roll out the hose drum to give fuel to another airplane. And at the top of climb, White 4's hose drum unit failed, HDU, we call them. It failed. And so he had absolutely no choice but to drop out. His role had been originally the long track role down to the Falklands. So he was one of the leaders. I called Frank Milligan, who'd been one of my flying instructors when I went through flying training. He's also a lad from Alverston, so he's a local chap. Um, ever such a nice man. And he was angry as could be about this. He actually wanted to be there, but it wasn't to be. So Frank drops out and Blue 3 slots into his role. Um, and that is, I'm just trying to get my names right, make sure I don't get these wrong. Um, that is Bob Tuxford. Um, we then have what is called a tank line here. It's a, it's a bracket of about 30 minutes where you begin to refuel whoever you're refueling and then you stop refueling. And the plan there pretty well worked according to plan. Um, the, the Vulcan was refueled by Blue 4, uh, sorry, uh, by Blue 1, and then he returned. Two of the Red Victors refueled the other two and went back, and the same happened in that line there. So tank one, okay, no particular issues. Um, Martin Withers had an initial issue finding the aeroplane because they were going out in the dark with lights off. They didn't have lights on, which when they were training, they always had the lights on. So it was a little bit of a problem, um, but they did make contact and they did actually do it. So now we've got, after those four victors return, we've now got a line of aeroplanes, two red victors, one blue, one white, and Vulcan to go down to the tank two line. On the tank two line, the plan was that red four would feed red two and then feed white two, and red two would give fuel to. <laughs> um, to the Vulcan. And again, Everything goes reasonably okay. So we're at the top, we're on tank two, everything's gone reasonably according to plan. And then we're coming down to tank three. And the plan here is that that's not the plan. Not yet. Go away. Right. Um, the plan is Victor refuels Vulcan. Vulcan flies on. Same Victor refuels. This victor, who would go on, but it didn't work because at that point, I've given it away, they ran into the most almighty thunderstorm. Um, no way over it because they were far too heavy, no way around it because it was far too big. The further you go off track, the more fuel you use, you jeopardize the plan anyway. So they have to go through it. Something you would never normally do, but we're at war. So you do things you don't normally do. So um, 
at this point, there is a probe problem. Uh, let me get this right now, the right way around. It's the aircraft has taken on fuel and now wants to give it, but he can't. So we have a probe issue again. So he can't accept the fuel, but he can give fuel. Didn't make sense to me when I read the book. <laughs> um, but moving on, that's an artist's impression of what it was like. I can only tell you the variation when you're flying in and around lightning is from utter pitch black because your eyes have lost their night vision to the flashes of light in front of you. And all you can see is actually the arc of lightning. You can't see a damn thing either side of it. And it burns your retina. That's a tremendous situation to be in. And these guys had to go through that while they were refueling, which is the reason why the guy on the Victor lost the tip of his probe. Not his fault, not his fault at all. Um, but bloody bad luck. But they were thinking in these aeroplanes because, ah, no, that's interesting, that's all right. Uh, my graphic's not perfect, I'll have to flick through that. What they actually did was reversed roles. So Bob Tuxford, who'd been giving the fuel, and Steve Biglands, who broke his probe, reversed places, reversed the fuel, and then it was Steve who actually went back, and Bob Tuxford who went on, who then, the other side of the lightning storm, refueled the Vulcan on tank five, and refueled the Vulcan, uh, sorry, tank four, and then again on tank five. So giving as much as he possibly could. In fact, on tank five, Bob Tuxford, gave away so much fuel that he was in jeopardy of not getting back to his first tank spot itself. Um, and at that point, Martin Withers and crew didn't understand why they hadn't received as much fuel on the aeroplane as they should have done. I think there were 7,000 pounds under their anticipated uplift, which then gave them the problem of, can we do a target run climb back out and then meet our tanker on the way back because there was another plan for the recovery. So this was fraught and it was a big decision for Martin to take. Can, do I carry on or do I say we've just reached Mission Impossible and I have to call quits? After everything they'd been through, it was a tough call, but Martin made the call as the captain and said, we're going ahead with the bombing run. Now, sorry, I've just got to go through that bit again. Um, now, um, the Vulcan is refueled all the way through Port Stanley. Is it refueled on the way back? Well, we shall see. But the attack profile is from the northeast and then corrected very slightly to run in on the target run towards Port Stanley. The target being a runway, it was quiet on the way in, no signs of radar, so no threats. Um, so it was all quiet. The Argentinians certainly weren't expecting them. They descended as required down to low level to get underneath the radars with the intention of climbing again to their bombing altitude that the CAS had briefed as 8,000 feet. Martin had looked up the intelligence himself and decided he would drop from 10,000 feet. Does it make a difference? Let's have a look. That is the pattern of Martin's bombing. The first bomb in a stick of 21, hits the center of the runway. All the others spread themselves across the south side of the airfield. I suggest to you this, that if you put the parameters for bombing at 8,000 feet into the NAV bombing system, they're going to travel a certain distance forward. If you then climb to 10,000 feet, but don't tell the NAV bombing system, your bombs are going to travel further. And I personally believe the reason the bombs went where they did is because he overthrew the bombs. It's only my thinking, but that is what I believe. I don't believe that should have happened. I think the stick should have straddled the runway, almost certainly. So the damage caused was not as great as it could have been. So the return to ascension. Coming back from the runway, we have a tank six, which required four victors to take off in the early hours of the morning 
to fly south to do exactly what they'd done before. Two to refuel the other two, the other, those two to go on. One to refuel the long range tanker, which would meet Artin somewhere off Rio de Janeiro, which was the, the rendezvous point. Martin had never seen such a small amount of fuel in a Vulcan's tanks when he actually joined up. He had 7,000 pounds left. Um, I can only explain to you that there are 14 tanks in a Vulcan to carry the fuel. And if you spread 7,000 pounds across 14 tanks, it's 500 pounds in each. And you are sucking fumes, quite frankly. So um, it was a bit of a close call. But they did make it, and the rest of this is history. So that is actually a photograph taken out of the Victor as Martin plugged in for that return just off Reno. Um, a beautiful shot. Um, and that is from a side window of the Victor just after Martin had broken away, having breathed a huge sigh of relief. He'd got his fuel, the probe hadn't broken, um, and all the other things that could go wrong. And bear in mind, at this point, these guys have now flown for over 10 hours. Um, having got airborne at 11 o'clock at night, having only landed at 7 o'clock the same morning, having flown from the UK on another 10-hour flight. This is enormous. Um, the fatigue level must have been just something else. Running on adrenaline is all I can say. And there they are, Martin in the centre. Um, a a well-deserved DFC. Blackbird mission did a stop with Blackbird 1. I have nearly finished. You can go to sleep soon. Um, there were seven planned in all, but only five that actually succeeded because the middle two, three and four, cancelled weather. Well, we know what bad weather can do to probes. Not a good idea. Um, and the second one was cancelled with a refueling fault in one of the Victor fleets. And if you lose on it, that's a 10, you just can't do it. Um, <laughs> the others, um, Neil McDougall did finally get down there um, and actually ran anti-aircraft radar flights to go down. I should say John Reeve did get there as well on Black Duck 2, sorry. Um, I'll come to him again in a moment. And then Martin got to fly the last one on Black Duck 7. Um, the thing that struck me as peculiar is 1st of May, 4th of May, successful, and then nothing tried until the 13th, then the 28th, and then the 31st, when they actually went against the radar again. So a big gap between the Vulcan appearing and threatening Stanley with the Argentinians on the airfield. I, I, I kind of question why? Why did he leave it such a big gap? Maybe it could have been done with a smaller one. Um, but it is what it is. The Vulcan with the Shrike missile um, is there. That is the anti-radiation missile. So if you are aware that the threat is coming your way, um, like the Buccaneers with the Westinghouse pod, we also took the Shrike missiles off the, the Buccaneers because with the information from the Westinghouse, you then have the ability to actually take the radar out. And so there were three attempts to actually hit the airfield using these with mixed results, um, I think. There were possibly two SAM control radars were taken out, but the main airfield radar itself continued to operate right through. The black dot, sorry, I'll just come back to that. Um, these black dots here and there are actually the bomb craters. That's Martin Withers' room, supporting my conjecture that he overthrew the bomb slightly. Those two clusters there are a combination of John Reeves bombs and Martin with a second run. And so you can see the spread is a little better, but they're off the runway. Um, whether that was deliberate or not, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. The book doesn't really explain terribly much. Um, but those are the craters that existed. The effect was positive in the sense that it deterred the Argentinians from using that airfield in the way that they might have done. Um, they were stuck with light attack aircraft, Pocaras in the main, um, that we can see lined up here. The thing that strikes me as a pilot is how damned and tidy they are. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we were very good at lining things up in straight rows in the military in the RF. That's not what I'm getting at. What I would 
point out of the pilot is that if you're going to park your aeroplanes on a very windy island, the least you do is point them all into wind. It doesn't matter if they're lined up, but you point them into wind, because otherwise they might just take off. Um, so I, it, it, it kind of shows a mindset in the Argentinian military, I think, which is perhaps not nearly as well trained as we might be. Um, so Martin's bombs there, John Reeves bombs there. Martin's second raid is not on this intelligence picture, and I couldn't find one that actually showed them all. Um, but you could see that John's nicely straddled and spread the runway, but are just offset from it a little bit. He just needed to bring them this way. Um, but those are effectively the results. But it did inhibit use of the airfield. And that is actually the task that Margaret Thatcher had given to Mike B in the, in the briefing. Stop them using that airfield and the RAF job is done. So it was a, a success. Um, looking at the one crater that hit the runway, um, I've seen Kate and Wood in a voice state. <laughs> Um, it doesn't look significant, does it? And, and yet, I think it must be partially filled in because my understanding of the craters were about 10 feet deep, so I'm, I'm not sure what well, that picture... many of the roads in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, so, so, yes, it's just it's a picture of it. Uh, sorry, I got my no. And so, um, any questions? It was a successful measure, I think. I've talked far too long, and the only reason for that is I didn't get the chance to rehearse this at all. <laughs> so that's the first point. It'll be better on the night. Um, in in uh, analysis of this, 